America had one in 1776, France in 1789, and so emboldened by the success of these revolutions, the Irish rose against Britain in 1798. And this is the story of one of the local men near to where I live. His name was Michael Dwyer, also known as the Wicklow Chieftain. The British Redcoats would chase him for literally years before he surrendered and was transported to Australia. The Rebellion of 1798 was a major uprising against British rule in Ireland, organised by the Society of United Irishmen. It was formed by Protestant Presbyterian radicals and joined by many from the majority Catholic population. Following some initial successes, particularly in Kildare, Wicklow and Wexford, the uprising was suppressed initially by government militia and yeomanry forces, followed up by units of the British Army with a death toll estimated between 10,000 and 50,000 people. A French expeditionary force that landed in County Mayo in support of the rebels was eventually defeated. Michael Dwyer joined the Society of United Irishmen in the spring of 1797. When the rebellion broke out on the 23rd of May 1798, the government yeomanry executed his uncle along with 35 others on Dunlavin Green. So yeomanry or yeomen were a type of local part-time soldier, a level above the militia, as many of them formed cavalry units because they were wealthy enough to be able to supply their own horses. Now, they would have harboured local grudges against suspected United Irishmen and were responsible for many atrocities, like the one on Dunlavin Green. As a captain, he fought in battles at Arklow, Ballyellis, Hackettstown and Vinegar Hill, but after the rebels' major defeat at Vinegar Hill, he withdrew to the safety of the Wicklow Mountains and his home turf, the Glen of Emal. Later, many rebels stopped fighting following the news of the defeat of the French landing force, but Dwyer fought on. He and his men began a campaign targeting local loyalists and yeomen, attacking small parties of the military and eluding any major sweeps against them. Due to the constant hunt for him, Dwyer relied on a large and extended family network and a series of hides including dugouts, caves and safe houses. Dwyer's guerrilla tactics were said to have inspired another rebel leader, Michael Collins, over 100 years later. This would result in the expenditure of hundreds of thousands of pounds on the part of the government in a massive military campaign to catch him, which resulted in the construction of the famous military road that ran across the spine of the Wicklow Mountains, along with four military barracks to protect it. Dwyer had become a legend, regarded by the ordinary people of Ireland as a symbol of their continuing struggle for independence. However, Near the Glen of Amal, he and his men were betrayed by a spy. One of his best men was called Sam McAllister, a Presbyterian who had deserted from the Antrim militia to join Dwyer. The following account was given in the oral tradition. The cottages were surrounded by at least a hundred soldiers. The eight men in the two cottages were taken by surprise and arrested before they could offer resistance. One turned informer and the rest were executed in Bolton Glass a few days later. The weather was wet and the soldiers' powder rendered useless. Ironically, they were only able to exchange fire with the rebels in Dwyer's cottage because they had appropriated the dry powder of the rebels they had captured in the other cottages. This is a replica of Brown Bess, the nickname for the British Army's land pattern musket as it was officially known. It was a standard musket from 1722 until 1838 of the British Army. It's estimated that over four million of them were made and were carried by British forces across their empire and so too in Ireland. Dwyer McAllister and the two other men with them in the third cottage were called upon to surrender but they refused. In the siege that followed, the cottage was set on fire. Two of the men were killed and McAllister was wounded. Knowing that he would not be able to escape and perhaps suspecting that capture would mean execution, McAllister said to Dwyer, I am no use now and you can't be spared. I will go to the door and discharge the blunderbuss. They will fire at me and you may be off before they reload again. McAllister was killed the instant he opened the door. Dwyer made his break and slipped on a patch of ice as he was rounding the corner of the cottage. 
He stumbled just as a volley was discharged at him. A ball struck him in the clothing, but he was not injured. It took about 15 to 20 seconds to reload as the gunpowder ball and wad all had to be rammed down the barrel, followed by priming the pan here before it was able to be fired. And if enough powder wasn't placed in the pan, nothing would happen. And you just get a flash, a flash in the pan, and that's where the term comes from. Half naked and without shoes or stockings, he set off across the fields with a Highlander hot on his heels until Dwyer tripped him up. Dwyer said later that if the Highlander had not been so close behind him, the other soldiers would certainly have fired and brought him down. In terms of accuracy, under test conditions, at a distance of 100 yards, just over half the shots were on target. But of course, that depended on the level of training the soldier had that was using it. The limitations of Brown Bess would help Dwyer in his escape. He quickly outdistanced his pursuers through the heavy snow, but was then sighted by another group of soldiers who had been alerted by the gunshots. Dodging the fire from their muskets, and with his bare feet bleeding profusely, he leapt across a swollen branch of the River Slaney. Seeing blood in the snow from his bleeding feet, they thought he had been wounded and would not be able to go far, but the shots had gone over his head, and he escaped to trouble the authorities for nearly five more years. The Dwyer McAllister Cottage was restored in the 1940s and is now a national monument that can be visited by the public during the summer months. The next story relates to Dwyer sleeping in a cave called St. Kevin's Bed near Glenda Lock. It is thought that the 6th century saint actually did use it for his retreats. But Dwyer was surprised by a group of Scottish Highlanders sent specifically to hunt him down. Now I went to the location to film this and I had my own doubts as to whether this actually happened. However, it is a good example of how the oral tradition of storytelling of a local hero up against a literal empire can be embellished. And it is, after all, how legends are made. The following account was given in the Dublin Penny Journal of 1834 and you can make up your own mind. Dwyer thought it high time for him to bolt, and so, naked so that he might run light, he took his well-known pass up the face of Lug Duff, the Highlanders, like sporting fellows, immediately grounded their muskets and bayonets in hand, started off in pursuit. And of course an essential part of the Brown Bess is its detachable bayonet, which measures about 17 inches and has a triangular blade. It is with these that the Highlanders pursued Dwyer. In the meantime, Dwyer was toiling up the face of the mountain, when halfway up the hill he turned round to look after the Scotchmen and saw that all of them had turned either right or left and had left the whole of the lakeside without a man. Dwyer at once changed his plan, bounced and bounded down the face of the hill, plunged into the lake at Temple Nishkelig and swam across the lake before he could say Jack Robinson and took possession of all the Scotchmen's muskets and cartridge boxes. One after another he pitched the guns and ammunition into the lake. You could hear his huzzas rattling and echoing through the hills as if the mountains clapped their hands with joy. He then very leisurely lounged away towards his old haunts under Lug Naquilla. The finale came in the autumn of 1803 when the government launched their biggest military campaign yet under General Beresford, designed to crush Dwyer once and for all. It started with the arrest of members of the Dwyer families and was quickly followed by the billeting of soldiers in every house in the mountains that Dwyer was thought to use. In 1803 he surrendered under the impression he would be sent to America, but the British changed his terms and instead was transported to New South Wales, Australia, a journey of 136 days and arrived as an unsentenced exile and free man in 1806. The extraordinary terms agreed with Dwyer for his surrender demonstrate most clearly how the government was glad to be rid of him. In Sydney in 1807 he was twice imprisoned and twice tried, but ultimately acquitted of plotting an Irish insurrection against the British rule in New South Wales by the famous Captain Bly of Mutiny on the Bounty fame. Bly was deposed as governor by the officers of the New South Wales Corps in what became known as the Rum Rebellion. The officers justified their actions by citing Bly's erratic and tyrannic behaviour and used Dwyer's trial and later imprisonment 
as an example of his behaviour. Dwyer was appointed Chief of Police in Liverpool, Sydney in 1813. In May 1825, due to the alleged non-payment of a £100 debt, he was committed to a debtor's prison, where he contracted dysentery. He was released in May 1825. Just three months later, he died in August 1825 at the age of 53. His four children that he had left back in Ireland only arrived in Australia three years after his death. In 1898, his remains were reinterred in Waverley Cemetery, Sydney. It was said a crowd of over 200,000 attended his reinterment. So I've never been to Australia, but the memorial is reputed to be the largest monument to the 1798 rebellion in the world. When I was 17, I joined my local army reserve unit. It drew on men from the Wicklow area. Our shoulder battalion flash for the 21st Infantry included the name of Dwyer and a fighting pike. The 1798 rebellion remains a significant event in Irish history and was instrumental in the development of modern Irish nationalism, while several of the rebellion's key figures such as Wolf Tone became important reference points for later republicanism. Thank you for watching, but please like and subscribe as this will encourage future productions.